Hi and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video I want to talk about an article called The World Well Lost, published in 1972 by the American philosopher Richard Rorty. It is quite an early Rorty article. It was written seven years before the publication of his famous book Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature. Um, and that means that it was written 17 years before the publication of his second famous book, Contingency, Irony and Solidarity, about which I did a series of videos on this channel a little while ago. The World Well Lost is the first article in Rorty's um, book, Consequences of Pragmatism, which collects papers that he wrote in the 1970s. In The World Well Lost, Rotti is interested in the notion of an alternative conceptual framework. The idea which we find, for instance, in somebody like Thomas Kuhn uh, or Paul Feyerabend, that you could have like totally different ways of conceptualizing the world, so different that um, there is, there's no way to even compare them. Right? So it would be the case that there are different ways of thinking about the world such that people, if they're people, let's say they're people, that people having these different conceptual schemes wouldn't even be able to talk to each other. Right? They wouldn't even be able to understand each other, uh, no matter how, how much they tried, as long as they kept using those conceptual schemes. So Rotti is going to talk about that, and especially he's going to argue against that. And he is going to claim that if we follow the thread of his argument, then we are going to end up sort of rejecting as useless the strong metaphysically realist notion of world. So let's see how he gets there. Uh, and then of course, I mean, once you do reject this strong metaphysical realist notion of world, um, you have the world well lost as the title of the, um, of the paper has it. Now, at the same time that Rorty is going to tell his argumentative story, he is telling something of a historical story as well. That will be a feature of all of Rorty's later writings. He's going to be telling a, a historical story, and this is a historical story that focuses on Kant. Now, I think that Rorty's Kant interpretation in this article is uh, fundamentally wrong, uh, and I'll say a little bit about that. But I also think that the Kant interpretation that Rorty uses in this article is historically very influential. Like a lot of people have read Kant in the way that Rotti reads him, and that is really what Rotti needs for his historical story to make sense. Right? He's talking about the influence of Kant, uh, and so all he needs is an influential interpretation of Kant, not necessarily the right interpretation of Kant. Uh, but I'm gonna say something about what the right interpretation of Kant might be anyway. So what is the historical claim about Kant? Well, the claim is that Kant brings in a distinction, the distinction between human sensibility, in which we are given objects by the world, and you know, when, when we are given an object, Kant calls this an intuition, or Kant's English translators call it an intuition. Um, and on the other hand, there is the understanding, which uses concepts. And on, well, that's, that's certainly true. I mean, Kant talks about that a lot. But now on Roddy's interpretation, the way to think about this is to think about this as a process of two steps, right? In the first step, the world influences us and we get these sensible intuitions. So they're there, sensible intuitions. And then in the second step, the understanding is going to apply its concepts to those sensible intuitions, right? So we have a, a two-step process, uh, or we could say a two-layer mind, right? There's the sensible layer, and then there's the intelligible layer or intellectual layer, and sort of before we get to a cognition, we first go into the first layer, and then we go into the second layer. What Rorty says is that once we accept that picture, then it becomes very, very plausible to ask the following question. Couldn't it be the case that other beings, and maybe even other human beings, use different concepts, right? That they get the same intuitions, but then apply not these concepts to them, but let's say these concepts 
right? And they get a totally different series of, of judgments. Um, they, they speak a totally different language, which, which is not like our language at all, but which is equally about the world. Um, it, it equally touches on those, on those intuitions. And what makes this possible is, as Rorty says, and this is on page four, page four of the pagination in, in Consequences of Pragmatism, um, he says, the possibility of different conceptual schemes highlights the fact that a Kantian unsynthesized intuition can exert no influence on how it is to be synthesized. That is, what the world gives us, so that, that's going to be the unsynthesized intuition awaiting synthesis by the understanding. It's passive, it's just there, and it could be synthesized maybe in many, many different ways. Right, that is the picture, that is the Kant interpretation, and that is what leads to the idea that there might be different conceptual schemes. Okay, let's talk about conceptual schemes in a moment. First, give me a minute or so, maybe slightly more, to talk about Kant. If you have watched my, my series on Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, you know what I'm going to say. And if you haven't watched it and you do want to know a little bit more about this particular issue, then you should watch the video about James Conant and the layer cake conception of human mindedness. So James Conant has written this article um, on the layer cake conception of human mindedness in which he attacks Kant interpretations like Rorty's that have these two steps, these two layers where there's first the intuitions and then we bring concepts to bear on them. And Conant argues, I think fully persuasively, that no, when you read Kant and when you look at what Kant is doing, you've got to see him as claiming that we can only have intuitions because our concepts are always already at work, right? There are no two things we can separate. We can't separate out the intuition and the concepts uh, as sort of two steps in one process. Intuitions are only possible because they're also already conceptual, because the intellect is always already working on them. Uh, I think that's the right way to read Kant. I think that's the only way to, to really make sense of what Kant is doing in the early parts of the Critique of Pure Reason. Uh, but again, I don't think it's, it's important really for Rorty's historical story what Kant is what Kant is really saying, because this two-layer reading of Kant has been very influential, and it might very well be the historical antecedent of, um, of this thinking about, about conceptual schemes. Let me, like the last thing I want to say here about Kant is that, um, is that Kant himself, and, and I think this is important to realize, Kant himself never suggests that there might be alternative conceptual schemes and Kant suggests that there might be alternative schemes. He does suggest that there might be alternative forms of sensibility. Right? We sense the world as spatio-temporal, and Kant says maybe there are other beings with a different form of sensibility. But he doesn't say, and he can't say, that there might be beings with different, a different conceptual scheme. Why not? Because all of Kant's a priori uh, concepts, like the fundamental concepts of judgment, follow immediately from what it is to make a judgment, right? And so any being that thinks conceptually is, according to Kant, going to need the same fundamental concepts. It is only in using those same fundamental concepts um, that one can even have judgments about objects. Uh, and so I don't think Rorty says anything in his article against that kind of possibility. Okay, that's what I'm going to, uh, to say about Kant. Now we are going to return to the Rotti article. So, okay, suppose that we have this vision of the possibility of conceptual schemes, of different ways of thinking about the world that are so different that you can't even really compare them. Well, Rotti says there are a lot of reasons to worry that this doesn't make any sense. Okay, so first of all, he tells us, this Kantian picture is sort of self-undermining. Why? Well, because these intuitions, they are sort of ineffable, right? By definition, because concepts have not yet been applied to them, by definition, we can't really say anything about them or, or, or think any, any thoughts about them. Um, 
They are ineffable, right, in the strictest sense of the term. They are not possible objects of thought. So what are they doing? I mean, what role do they have in our philosophical thinking? Don't they just kind of fall out, like leaving us with only concepts? Yeah, I mean, this is actually a reason to believe that that was not what Kant was saying, but okay. Um, I can't resist returning to Kant, as you can see. Um, so there is something in the very Kantian picture that sort of leads to the rejection of the idea of an unsynthesized intuition. And once we reject that, then the very basis for thinking in terms of different conceptual schemes that apply to the same world sort of disappears as well. Okay, so that's that's one thing. Another thing, another attack on the idea of conceptual schemes, Rotti says, uh, comes from Quine, the, the Quine of two dogmas of empiricism. So in two dogmas of empiricism, um, which I also made a video about, by the way, in two dogmas of empiricism, Kant, uh, sorry, Quine, suggests that there is no difference between analytic and synthetic statements. And those would be statements about meaning and statements about the way that the world is. Well, if there's no difference between statements about meaning and statements about the way the world is, then you can't really say what somebody's conceptual scheme is because a conceptual scheme is supposed to be sort of like defined by those things that a person holds to be true because of the concepts that that person uses. So these are statements, about, these are claims about which statements are true because of their meaning, right? There's supposed to be a conceptual scheme, which is a series of concepts that have definitions. So that's all about meaning. And then we apply it to the world. And that's when we start making claims that have to do with empirical content. If we can't make the distinction between analytic and synthetic statements, um, Rotti is suggesting, then we also can't really make the distinction between a conceptual scheme on the one hand and its application to the world on the other hand. So that is the second reason to be doubtful about conceptual schemes. Um, the third reason, and I think Rorty, uh, Rorty likes this one maybe the most, is Davidson's argument. Uh, and this is something that one can find, for instance, in um, uh, on the very idea of a conceptual scheme. That's the title of Davidson's article, on the very idea of a conceptual scheme, uh, where Davidson suggests that we could never be in a situation where we can conclude that somebody uses a conceptual scheme that is different from ours, right? That somebody uses a conceptual scheme that is incommensurable with ours, that can't be translated into ours. Why? Well, suppose that somebody is using a conceptual scheme that can't be translated into ours. And I'm going to really simplify Davidson uh, for our purposes here. Suppose that somebody does use a conceptual scheme that is untranslatable into ours, right? That means that when this person makes noises, we cannot recognize them as linguistic utterances, as sentences, as propositions, because if we could recognize them, if there was any way that we could make sense of them, any way we could relate them to what happened in the world and so on and so forth, then, they would be translatable, right? Then it wouldn't be incommensurable. Then it wouldn't really be an alternative conceptual scheme. Um, and so any evidence that somebody is using a conceptual scheme different from ours is at the same time evidence that this person is just making noises that are not a language at all, that this person isn't even speaking, that this person isn't using concepts. Right? There is a sense in which somebody using a different conceptual scheme from ours is just like a tree whose leaves are, you know, moving in some semi random pattern in the wind. And we look at it and we, we can't see any propositional content there. Right. We have no idea what it means and we can keep on sort of interpreting and we have no success. And of course, we conclude that the tree is not speaking, right, that the tree is not using a conceptual scheme that is not ours. Uh, the tree is not speaking at all. So for Davidson, um, it, there's no way to find out that somebody uses a conceptual scheme that is not ours. And so this sort of falls away as a possibility, right? It's not a possibility that we could ever recognize. 
Now, would Rotti... Um, what Rotti goes on to investigate is a possible rejection of this Davidsonian argument, right? There's a possible rejection that would go like this. All that Davidson shows is that we couldn't recognize somebody using an alternative conceptual scheme. But maybe there is somebody using an alternative scheme, even if we can't recognize them, right? Isn't Davidson confusing two things? Like what we can know and what can be the case? Or as, uh, as Rotti itself, uh, you know, using Latin terms uh, formulates it, isn't there a difference between the ordo cognoscendi, the order of knowing, and the ordo essendi, the order of being? Um, and if there is such a difference, then how could an argument like Davidson's ever achieve what it sets out to achieve? And Rotti says, you know, a lot of discussions with the skeptics sort of end up in this way, right? The skeptic says, maybe this, and you say, well, that makes no sense. And then the skeptic says, okay, it doesn't really make sense to us, but that doesn't mean that it isn't possible. And then you're sort of at an impasse, right? Where you're like, I don't know. I don't know how to deal with that. Um, and where the reaction would mostly be, well, well, whatever, right? Unless you come up with some plausible scenario, I have no need to listen to you. So here's what Rotti suggests. He suggests that in this particular case, um, the anti-Davidsonian can tell a story that makes it mildly plausible that there could be an alternative conceptual scheme. And that is the story of the galactic civilization. Right, and the story of the galactic civilization goes like this. If we look at the ancient Greeks, for instance, we see that they think in a very different way from us. It's not a radically different conceptual scheme because we can still understand them, right? We can read their works, but it's very different from the way that we think. Now extrapolate that, right? I mean, okay, that was like less than 3000 years. So now extrapolate that to 300,000 years or more if you want to, right? And assume that the changes, you know, are gonna keep coming at the same pace, then surely, the way that people are going to think in 300,000 years, like in the galactic civilization, is going to be so different from ours that there's got to be this incommensurability, that it's got to be a really, fully different and incomparable conceptual scheme. Does that story make sense? Well, I think that Rorty might have been even more critical than he is, right? Because it is an assumption in this story that we can extrapolate, right, into a completely different conceptual scheme, but can at the same time still keep talking about those people 300 years from now having certain beliefs and talking a language and investigating the world and having concepts and so on and so forth. And so what Rorty has to sort of be assuming for this story to even make sense is that there is nothing in the notion of a belief or the notion of a concept or the notion of um, um, investigating the world or whatever, that there's nothing there that sort of is impossible to square with the notion of incommensurability and having an alternative conceptual scheme, right? That merely by having beliefs, somebody must have a commensurable conceptual scheme or, you know, must be the kind of being that we can get into a relation of understanding with. Uh, that's, that doesn't seem to be on the, on the table for Rorty here. Uh, and I think it has to be on the table. I mean, that is at least the kind of conclusion that I would like to draw from uh, from Davidson. And again, I mean, this is the kind of conclusion that if we have a good interpretation of Kant, uh, would be what Kant himself is saying, right? That the very notion of judgment generates a certain kind of conceptual scheme that anyone who judges um, sort of has to share, no matter how different their language may be otherwise. All right, anyway, that is not, uh, not the way that Rotti is taking this. Uh, Rotti is taking it sort of, like like he takes it to the extreme 
and he says, well, if we can't, if it's possible for, for a galactic visitor using a time travel machine to come here and be completely ununderstandable to us, even though we have good reasons to believe that, you know, they are using a particular conceptual scheme, um, well, then it seems that we can also never know whether butterflies or trees are really talking and, and have a different conceptual scheme than we have. Okay, maybe, maybe that's extreme, right? Maybe that's a reason to not allow this extrapolation. Well, you know, says Roddy, I don't know. Um, I don't see any principled reason for claiming um, that this extrapolation is, is impossible. So, are the galactics or the butterflies different sorts of persons than ourselves or not persons at all? This is what he's asking on page 11. Are the galactics or the butterflies different sorts of persons than ourselves or not persons at all is also not very important. So Rotti is here claiming that it's not very important to answer this question. He is dismissing the kind of, you know, philosophical theorizing that wants to find essential features of persons. Um, this is a kind of Rottian move that is very familiar to the readers of his later philosophy, where you come upon a sort of philosophical puzzle and then Rotti says, yeah, I mean, who cares, right? It doesn't really make a difference. Um, we can sort of make an arbitrary choice or just leave it up in the air. Because what is really important, he says, what is in question is just the best way of predicting, controlling and generally coping with the entities in question. Well, maybe it is, right? But one could say that if somebody was using a conceptual scheme, if they were a person, then we don't just want to predict and control and cope with them, but we want to understand them. And if they're not a person and we can't understand them, that's like any sort of substantial notion of understanding seems to be something that Rotti has to to leave aside here, has to sort of um, not think of as philosophically or morally important. That's, I guess, one of the points where we can say, wait, wait a second, um, this is where I'm, I'm leaving, I'm going in a different direction from Rotti. That's where I would be tempted to go in a different direction from Rotti and saying that, well, actually this does, I mean, whether something is a person or not does seem to be an important question um, because it informs how we should, what, what we, what we can even try to achieve, right? Is it just about controlling, like inanimate nature, or is it about understanding? Okay, I know what Rotti would say to that. Rotti would say to that, well, there is no principled philosophical answer to that. Um, it's just a choice. Or maybe it's just a historical contingency based on who you have learned to see as being part of your community. That's the kind of way that Rotti wants to uh, defuse that question, sort of, take away it's it's the the take away the illusion according to Rotti, right take away the illusion that it is like a philosophically foundational question that ought to have some kind of deep philosophical answer so anyway Rotti ends up with what he calls a don't care conclusion this is page 12 this don't care conclusion is all I have to offer concerning the antinomy created by Davidson Stroud argument on the one hand and the skeptics extrapolation on the other. So Rotti says, I don't care whether we want to say that the galactic visitor is a person very different from us or not a person, right? I don't think it's very important. Um, but he says, the fact that I don't care about that doesn't mean that I don't care about Davidson. I do care about this Davidson Stroud argument. Um, and I think its importance can be brought out, especially by looking at a standard objection to the coherence theory of truth. So what does the coherence theory of truth say? Uh, it says something like, to be true is to cohere with our other beliefs, right? Something is true if it fits my other beliefs. Now, a lot of people might agree that that is the test for truth, right? If I want, if somebody comes to me and says, I just saw a flying elephant, then I think, does this cohere with my beliefs? Well, you know, this is an honest person normally, right? He doesn't tell lies all the time. On the other hand, can elephants fly? 
No. So probably I'm going to conclude that it's not true. I'm not going to believe it. Um, I'm going to investigate whether this person wants to pull my leg, um, whether he is sort of reading from a work of fiction, whether he has been taking weird drugs or whatever. So coherence as a test for truth is relatively unproblematic, but the realist would say something like, and I'm using realist in a very vague sense here, the realist would say something like, well, you know, it's one thing for something to cohere with your beliefs, but of course it's something else for that statement to be true. Because to be true means to fit the world, not fit your beliefs, but fit the world, right? And this is where world comes into the uh, paper, which is after all called the world well lost. So world, how do we get in touch with the world? That's what the objector wants to, wants to know. Well, what Davidson suggests in this same article um, on the very idea of a conceptual scheme is that if we meet someone and we start interpreting their language, you know, we've got to assume that their conceptual scheme is like ours. And as he works this out, this turns out to mean that we've got to assume that they are mostly right. Right? All conceptual schemes agreeing sort of means that everyone has to be mostly right about everything. Again, I'm not going to go into details uh, here. We can't do the entire Davidson paper, but that is sort of Davidson's conclusion. In order to interpret what somebody... I mean, here's, here's a very simple, very simple illustration, maybe. Suppose that you come across somebody and every single thing that that person says is false, right? So when you show them a bread, they say, oh, that's not a bread. When they are clearly hungry and you ask them, do you want something to eat? They say no. And then they look very hurt when you don't give them any food, right? If, if they act like that, like consistently, then what should you conclude? Should you conclude that everything they say is false? Or should you conclude that they have a different language in which not means yes, uh, no means yes, and yes means no, and adding not to a sentence means affirming it, and failing to add not to a sentence means denying it. Well, you have to conclude the second, right? Clearly, they're speaking a language that works in the opposite way from ours. And once you know that, it turns out that so they ended up being mostly right. Okay, so this is how how Davidson sort of concludes that we are mostly right. And so we shall automatically be in touch with the world most of the time, um, whether or not we have any incorrigible or basic or otherwise privileged or foundational statements to make. Again, Rotti says, this is not going to be enough for the critic of the coherence theory. Because the critic of the coherence theory is going to say, no, no, all that Davidson can show us is that someone's beliefs have to be mostly like mine, right? We have to agree most of the time, but that doesn't mean that we are right most of the time because being right is not about agreement. Being right is about the world, right? That's what we want to know. We need to know whether my beliefs fit the world, whether they correspond with the world. Aha, says Roddy. This is the bottom of page 13. Now, to put my cards on the table, I think that the realistic true believer's notion of the world is an obsession rather than an intuition. A little bit later on. All that can be done with the claim that only the world determines truth is to point out the equivocation in the realist's own use of world. In the sense in which the world is just whatever the vast majority of our beliefs not currently in question are currently thought to be about, there is of course no argument, right? If we mean by the world, the tables and the walls and the sky and the trees and all the stuff that we all agree about. And somebody says, well, a theory can only be true if it agrees with all of that. Yeah, right? Yes, everyone agrees. But this perfectly fits a coherence theory. Right, where to be true of the world is to fit with you know our solid beliefs. That's not enough, right? That's not enough for somebody who wants to uh, be a realist. Uh, it's not enough for somebody. Again, I'm using this in a in a vague sense to just sort of mean the person that Rotti is talking to here. 
Um, that person wants something more. Again, page 14. This trivial sense in which truth is correspondence to reality and depends upon a reality independent of our knowledge is, of course, not enough for the realist. What he wants is precisely what the Davidson Strout argument prevents him from having. The notion of a world so independent of our knowledge that it might, for all we know, prove to contain none of the things we have always thought we were talking about. And a little later on, Rotty writes, to sum up this point, I want to claim that the world is either the purely vacuous notion of the ineffable cause of sense and go of intellect, or else a name for the objects that inquiry at the moment is leaving alone. So when we talk about the world, either we are talking about something that some big question mark, some we don't know, um, the essence of which is that it might be completely indescribable in our current language, right? That is what makes it the world, that it is completely independent of our conceptualizations, or the world is just whatever we tend to talk about, right? Whatever we are describing in our non-controversial statements. In the second sense, everybody agrees that there is a world and there's no philosophical problem. In the first sense, well, in the first sense, we can't have correspondence with the world if we have a coherence theory. But we can't have correspondence with the world if we have any other kind of theory either, because it's just a sort of ineffable nothing. Right? And so what Rorty is doing here is he's saying, well, that concept of the world is something we should get rid of. Right? That's just creating philosophical problems and doing no work. And so... He wants to remove altogether the realistic temptation to use the word world in the former vacuous sense. And so we should need to askew once and for all a whole galaxy of philosophical notions that have encouraged this use, in particular the Kantian distinctions I discussed at the outset. And he says if we do that, then we can return to the simple Aristotelian notion of truth as correspondence with reality with a clear conscience, for it will now appear as the uncontroversial triviality that it is. There's a lot of this that Kant would agree with. Right? I mean, when Kant says that he is an empirical realist, uh, I think what he's doing is he's saying, look, what my philosophy allows us to do is to return to the simple Aristotelian notion of truth as correspondence with reality with a clear conscience, as long as we're talking about the empirical, right? Okay, not saying that Rorty and Kant are, are sort of the same boat, but they are more in the same boat than Rorty thinks. So the world is well lost. Um, if we can, I'm, I'm reading out the final sentences of the article right now, if we can come to see both the coherence and correspondence theories as non-competing trivialities, then we may finally move beyond realism and idealism. We may reach a point at which, in Wittgenstein's words, we are capable of stopping doing philosophy when we want to. So here, I mean, yeah, I think it is useful. Um, to, to state once more and clearly the difference between what I take to be Rorty's position and what I take to be the real Kantian position. So I think they agree when it comes to empirical statements, um, they agree that there are no fundamentally different conceptual schemes um, and that when we say that we are sort of making true statements about the empirical world, that's, you know, just a kind of trivial claim. That is just claiming that we are talking about the kinds of things that we are surrounded with and that we are always talking about. Now, Rorty thinks that this is possible because we have put aside, in a sort of Wittgensteinian way, certain philosophical questions, right? We've put them aside. We don't answer them. Uh, we realize that we don't have to answer them. We just drop the entire distinction between realism and idealism. And here's how to do it, right? give up this this layer cake conception and so on on the other hand there is kant um who would say that no no what we need is a better theory of human knowledge um one which sort of shows that every thinker has to have the same conceptual scheme and this is the content of that conceptual scheme these are our basic a priori concepts and so we have a substantial philosophical theory which is going to be 
what Kant would call transcendentally idealist, right? I'm, I'm going to give you here this conceptual scheme that has to do with who we are as thinkers, but empirically realist, right? You don't need to worry about any of that when you're just dealing with the empirical world. So there's a very important metaphysical difference here. But some of the conclusions are kind of aligned, more so than, than Rotti uh, would think. All right, so that's the world well lost. I think there is in this early paper already a lot of the stuff that you are going to see in later Rotti, uh, especially this idea that we have to, through telling historical stories, unmask certain philosophical assumptions that once unmasked will make the problems disappear and allow us to have, you know, um, an unproblematic relation with reality. It allows us to stop asking philosophical questions when we want to.